These dark historical mysteries have puzzled experts and historians for decades and even centuries. They may never be solved as evidence has long been destroyed, but scholars hope they might one day be able to get to the bottom of the who, what, and why in these strange mysteries. Number 5 On the evening of November 30th, 1936, People as far away as Bristol and boats in the English Channel were able to see a spectacular fire that had engulfed a building on the outskirts of London. The building was the famous Crystal Palace, described as the world's biggest greenhouse. It had gone up in flames and by the following morning, it had been completely destroyed. The Crystal Palace had initially been built for the Great Exhibition in 1851 and was located in London's Hyde Park. It was designed by gardener Joseph Paxton and constructed mostly out of glass and iron. It was 990,000 square feet and was tall enough to house several full-sized elm trees. When the exhibition was over, the palace was dismantled and moved to a new location at the top of Sydenham Hill. At the time, this was just outside of London and was surrounded by greenery. The palace was extended and new gardens were built around it. It was hoped this would be a popular tourist attraction and continue to host events and exhibitions. Over the decades, the attraction fell into disrepair. A few businesses took up space in the building, but generally the owners were struggling to turn a profit. After the First World War, there was an effort to try to revive the palace to its former glory. Sir Henry Buckland was put in charge as manager, and he set about restoring areas and improving the gardens, bringing in new visitors. As well as being a good manager, Buckland had a love for the palace, and he even named his young daughter Crystal after it. Things were beginning to look up for the Crystal Palace when the fire took hold. It was first discovered by security at about 7.25 p.m. at the rear of the building, near the staff offices. The staff firemen tried to keep the flames under control, but it was already beginning to grow when Buckland stumbled across the fire not long after. He and Crystal had been walking the dog when they spotted the flickering orange light from outside the building. Crystal was sent to warn the choir and orchestra that were rehearsing in another part of the building, as Buckland tried to keep the fire under control. At first, the band didn't think there was anything to be worried about and assumed the fire would be quickly dealt with. It was only as the room they were in began to fill with smoke that they realized they needed to evacuate. For a while before the fire, there had been reports of a gas leak that hadn't been dealt with. The initial flames found the leak, which caused the fire to spread rapidly throughout the building. Even though the main structure was built from iron and glass, the floor was made from wood, with the space underneath for underfloor heating. This also helped the fire to spread. After decades of sitting in a greenhouse-like building, the wooden floor and furniture were incredibly dry and made for the perfect tender. Some of the glass panes had also been replaced with wood, adding more fuel to the fire. It wasn't until roughly 8 p.m. that the fire brigade was called. At first, only the local fire departments responded, but soon the London Fire Brigade sent engines to try to tackle the fire. Over 70 engines and 400 firefighters would try to control the flames throughout the night. There was also a large number of police on hand. While the building had been mostly empty when the fire started, news of the disaster spread almost as rapidly as the fire, and people traveled from London to see the spectacle. Some even paid to be taken up in aircraft to witness the destruction from above. The crowds made it harder for the fire crews to operate. One of the main worries was the South Water Tower, which stood at 275 feet tall. There were houses not far from the building, and the tower contained 12,000 gallons of water. If this part of the building was destroyed, it could cause even more destruction. Thankfully, the fire crews managed to stop the flames just feet away from the tower. Other than two water towers, little else remained. Glass from the building had shattered and some eyewitnesses reported seeing it melting and running into the gutters. Without the support from the glass, many of the beams buckled and parts of the building collapsed. The palace wouldn't be rebuilt. The building itself had been underinsured. For a long time, the building hadn't been turning a profit, and there hadn't been enough money to insure it properly. Some of the businesses inside the building were insured and received the correct payouts. 
but there were other things that couldn't be recovered as easily. One person who lost out in the fire was an inventor and electrical engineer who'd been using part of the building for experiments with television cameras. Much of his work was destroyed, putting him on the back foot in the rush to provide better technology for the new industry. There was never an investigation into what caused the fire, and no cause was ever found. If the fire had taken place just a little closer to London, it would have fallen under the domain of the London Fire Brigade, who were required to investigate any fire that required a certain number of engines in response. As it was, it was under the remit of the Kent Fire Services, who only investigated fires when someone had lost their life. Thankfully, nobody lost their life in this fire, but it did mean that there would be no investigation. There were a few theories put forward about what the cause of the fire was. Baird believed it had been sabotaged, but also suggested it could have been an accident. He reported that some of his workers had taken a shipment of gas cylinders late at night and left them with a the watchman. If they were leaking, they could have been ignited by the watchman's gas ring, but they would have likely caused a much more spectacular start to the fire. If it was sabotage, no specific individual or group of individuals have been put forward as possible culprits. It could have been someone trying to destroy Baird's work, but he was already struggling to get his new invention to work as well as competitors. There was no need to hinder Baird further. Another suggestion is that it could have been caused by a disgruntled employee from one of the other businesses who hadn't expected the inferno that would follow. An accident is the most popular theory. It could have been down to faulty wiring or something as simple as a cigarette not being put out properly. At the time, the Crystal Palace fire was the largest peacetime fire in England, but as there was no investigation into the cause, the story will always have unanswered questions surrounding it. Number 4 Stonehenge in Wiltshire, England is one of the most well-known and mysterious prehistoric monuments that's been discovered. It's attracted the attention of archaeologists and researchers for hundreds of years, and there are still almost as many questions surrounding the site as there were when it became a protected monument in the 1800s. But it isn't the only ancient structure found in that part of Wiltshire, and one of its neighbors is even more mysterious. The site was given the name Woodhenge after its discovery less than 100 years ago. This was technically a misnomer, but it helped the general public to imagine what the structure was like. Woodhenge was discovered first in 1926 by squadron leader Gilbert Insall, conducting aerial photography above this famous Stonehenge site. He noticed several dark rings in a field near the village of Durrington. There were other blotches and marks in the field, and it was clear that there was something beneath the earth here. At first, it was suspected that the site was a disc barrow, a circular burial mound. That alone would have been exciting, as these are less common than bell arrows and typically date back to the Bronze Age. But excavations uncovered something even more mysterious. It took two years for husband and wife team Ben and Maud Cunnington, leading a team of workers to excavate the site. They found evidence of wood posts that had stood in the ground thousands of years ago, as well as ditches and mounds that formed something like a hinge. The main structure consisted of six oval-shaped rings. The outer ring was made up of 60 posts packed tightly together. There was a ring of 16 slightly larger posts. The third ring featured the largest posts, with an average diameter of 35 centimeters. Then there were three more rings of posts and what seemed like a pyre in the center. The rings were oriented to point to the midsummer dawn and seemed to have had astronomical purposes. What the site may have looked like when it was built is hard to determine. Unlike the famous Stonehenge, their material at Woodhenge didn't survive the centuries since it was built. The timber may have begun to disintegrate even while the structure was in use, as there's evidence that some were replaced. At first, it was suggested that the structure might have had a roof and was actually a large building. But evidence of the removal of posts suggests that these were actually freestanding and not supporting anything above them. It also can't be determined for certain whether these posts were just stumps, like the concrete markers that stand in their place today, or if these towered into the sky like the monuments at Stonehenge. What it looked like was just one of the many unanswered mysteries that scholars have about this mysterious structure. One of the more fascinating questions is why it was built. It was suggested that this could have been some kind of prototype for Stonehenge. 
with the ancient builders testing techniques with the more manageable materials. But dating of the structure dismissed the idea. Exactly when it was built is hard to pinpoint, but it's believed that Woodhinge was constructed between 2470 and 2000 BC. Stonehenge may not have been completed until 1600 BC, but the more famous monument had been built in stages and construction had begun 1400 years earlier. It may not have been a prototype, but it definitely seems to have had something to do with Stonehenge. Not only were the two structures located very close to one another and built in the same time period, but there was also a series of banks and ditches between the two monuments. These are known as Stonehenge Avenue. Even though they aren't straight lines across the two miles between the two structures, they may have been built to make Stonehenge visible from Woodhenge and vice versa. One theory is that Woodhenge was designed as a place of celebration. Many artifacts have been found at the location, including a large amount of animal bones. These indicate feasting took place here. There were also pottery shards which could have carried food from other areas. This is very different from Stonehenge, where very little debris has been located. It's been suggested that Woodhenge was a place where all the community could gather to celebrate events like the summer and winter solstice, while Stonehenge was reserved for more elite members of the community. Another possibility is that Woodhenge was designed to symbolize life, with even the timber being symbolic of that, while Stonehenge symbolized the opposite. The two structures could have been used in parallel to one another. It's interesting to note that the landscape rises in the southwest, which would have prevented the midwinter sunset from being seen from Woodhenge. That led scholars to believe the summer solstice was more important for Woodhenge which would fit into the theory that this was a location about celebrating life. That isn't to say everything about the monument is about life. A number of burial mounds have been found, including one at the center of the monument. The skeleton discovered here was found in a crouched position and had damage to the skull. It wasn't clear during excavation whether this damage was the cause of the individual's passing, or if the weight of the soil above had caused the damage after the person was buried. But either way, it's believed that this might have been a dedicated sacrifice. The remains were exhumed and transported to London. Unfortunately, during the Blitz for World War II, they were destroyed, making any further investigation into them impossible. They weren't the only remains found here, and there were many other burial mounds found in the surrounding area. This has led some to believe that the site could have been important for ancestor worship. Radiocarbon dating of the artifacts found at Woodhenge indicates that it was in use as recently as 1800 BC, well into the Early Bronze Age. Why it was abandoned is another one of the mysteries surrounding the site. Stonehenge was still in use at this time, with some construction work going on into the 1600s BC. There doesn't seem to have been a major shift in this period, though the ancient Britons were gradually moving away from stone tools and into bronze work. Cremation replaced burial as the primary funeral practice, but many old round barrows were used for cremation ceremonies and there was no reason why this couldn't have been the case at Woodhenge in some way. There was even evidence of at least one cremation ceremony taking place here, so this likely wasn't the reason why it was abandoned. In recent years, researchers have begun to focus more and more on Woodhenge and the surrounding structures, rather than the more famous Stonehenge. It's possible that one day, excavations could help solve at least some of these questions, but it's likely that there will always be some mystery surrounding these ancient prehistoric monuments. Number 3 In past eras, many disturbing crimes would go unsolved. Without the technology that we have today, the chances of catching a criminal if they aren't caught in the act were relatively slim. Most of these long cold cases have been forgotten over the decades or centuries since they occurred. But when the victim is the son of the Pope and a member of one of the most notorious families in European history, the unsolved historical case remains discussed even 500 years later. The victim's name was Giovanni Borgia. The Borgias have gone down in history as one of the most villainous families from Renaissance Italy. Today, they're known as ruthless, and they would stop at nothing to keep themselves in power, and have committed disturbing acts on their enemies and on one another. The fact that Giovanni's father was a pope, a figure who's traditionally not supposed to have children, often sets the mood for stories about the family. 
In reality, the Borgias were no worse than any other Italian noble family of the era, and most of the stories about them were created by their enemies, of which they had many. But there is at least one scandal with some truth, the untimely passing of Giovanni, also known as Juan. Giovanni is one of four children that Pope Alexander VI is supposed to have had with his mistress. He was by far the favorite of both parents and would inherit many titles. But unfortunately for Giovanni, history doesn't remember him kindly. He was not very competent in any of his roles. His successes that he did have are said to have come either from his good looks or from the help of his father or other powerful relatives. His actions earned him a lot of enemies. On top of the enemies of his family, he had also angered the husbands and fathers of women whom he took as mistresses. There was also an intense rivalry with Giovanni's own brother, Cesare. Cesare had gone into the church like his father and was a cardinal at the time of the crime, but he believed he was better suited to the political and military roles that Giovanni had taken on. He couldn't take any titles while in the church and was looking for a way out of the clergy. Giovanni may have come into conflict with his youngest brother, Geoffrey, as there were rumors that the elder brother was having an affair with Geoffrey's wife. There was a lot going on in Giovanni's life in the summer of 1497, but he doesn't seem to have suspected any negative consequences catching up with him. It was June 14, 1497, when Giovanni was last seen alive. That evening, he joined his siblings and other family members at his mother's villa in the countryside near Rome. A feast was being held in his honor, though there doesn't seem to have been a particular reason for this. That wouldn't have been too unusual, though. Giovanni was his mother's favorite as well as his father's. During the evening, Giovanni was approached by a man in a mask. This man had been visiting Giovanni daily for a month and nobody seemed to know who he was. But the mysterious man didn't draw too much attention to himself. Late in the evening, Giovanni and Cesare left the house with their attendants to Papal Palace. Cesare made it home, but his brother told him he was going to visit a mistress. He dismissed his bodyguards and carried on with just his groom and the man in the mask. They continued to the Roman ghetto, a walled-in part of the city where Rome's Jewish population lived. There, Giovanni dismounted his horse and told his groom to wait for him. He gave a specific time that he would be back and made it clear that he did plan to return to the papal palace in the morning. The following morning, there was no sign of Giovanni at his home. His father wasn't immediately concerned. It was well known that Giovanni would spend time with women who were not his wife. Alexander assumed that Giovanni had spent the night with a mistress and didn't want to be seen leaving during daylight. It was only when the evening came and there was still no sign of Giovanni that Alexander started the search for him. Giovanni's horse had returned home without its rider or the groom. The groom was later found badly wounded. He would later pass away from his wounds and didn't have the strength to tell authorities what had happened to him. The search for Giovanni grew more urgent, and on the 16th, a timber merchant came forward with information. The man had been sleeping on his boat in the Tiber River the night that the victim had disappeared. He had just unloaded a large delivery of timber and was sleeping there to keep watch on it. At some point during the night, he saw four men come in pairs to check that the coast was clear. They apparently didn't see the merchant and returned with a fifth man on a horse. Behind the rider was a body, which was unceremoniously dumped into the river. The man threw stones at it to make sure that it sank. The merchant didn't find it suspicious at first. This was a section of the river where the local hospital would dump its waste. He told the Pope that he had seen a hundred bodies dumped in the river there, and nobody had ever searched for them. The Pope ordered that the river be searched, and Giovanni's body was found. He had multiple wounds from a sharp object, and had met with foul play. According to writers at the time, Alexander was so distraught that he locked himself away for hours and wouldn't eat for days. He launched an investigation into the crime, but this was quietly closed just a week later. The culprit or culprits were never identified, and the case remains unsolved 500 years later. That hasn't stopped people from speculating, both at the time and today. Cesare is a popular suspect. Even Queen Isabella of Spain thought Cesare was behind the crime, and Giovanni's widow tried to have Cesare tried for the crime. He would leave the church less than a year after Giovanni's attack and take on the military and political positions he had wanted for so long. 
it's been argued that he wouldn't have needed to take out Giovanni to leave the church, and would have done so if his brother had survived. If Alexander really hadn't wanted Cesare to leave the church, then the loss of Giovanni wouldn't have made that much of a difference, as they had a younger brother and Giovanni had a son who could have inherited any titles. Geoffrey was also considered a suspect, as were others with wives or daughters that Giovanni had relations with. Another popular theory is that the crime was committed as revenge by the Orsini family. The Orsinis were another powerful Roman family, and one that had come into conflict with the Borgia Pope many times. A few years earlier, when the King of France had invaded Italy, the Orsinis had sided with the French rather than the Pope. The French were eventually defeated, and the Orsinis were disgraced. Much of their land had been taken over by the papal army, led by Giovanni, and the patriarch Virginio Orsini was thrown in prison. He passed away in January of 1497. It's theorized that Alexander's favorite son was taken out as revenge for Virginio. Alexander would have quickly learned of this, but couldn't move against the Orsini family without causing a political crisis. The Orsini were later implicated in an attempt on Cesare's life in 1502 so this wouldn't have been beyond their power. Unless any long-lost letters written by the culprit are ever uncovered, the crime will forever remain a cold case, and one that adds to the legends of the infamous Borgia family. Number 2. Even those with very little knowledge of the ancient Egyptian gods will know that most of the gods were represented by the head of some kind of animal. The animal would be especially sacred to this god, and had characteristics that represented the god's domain. Horus had the head of a falcon, Taurad had the head of a hippo, and Sobek had the head of a crocodile. The infamous god Set was also depicted with the head of an animal, though which animal this is has baffled scholars for centuries. Set is a god with a particularly dark reputation. He was the god of deserts, storms, disorder, and foreigners. He's often depicted as the villain, and is responsible for taking the life of his brother Osiris, and trying to keep his nephew from the throne. His importance varied depending on the ruling dynasty, as he was worshipped more in some areas than others. In particular, he was the ruler of the Red Land, meaning the desert and the areas away from the Nile. His character is varied and sometimes contradictory. Like the other gods, he protects the sun during its trip through the underworld at night using storms to defeat the serpent that would devour it. But he also sows disorder in the lives of mortals. The set animal also has a lot of these qualities. It's cunning and intelligent, but vindictive and malevolent. It's definitely not the sort of animal that an ancient Egyptian would like to stumble across at night. But the actual identity of it is a mystery. In depictions of the set animal, it appears to be a canine with a slender body. Its tail is always straight and normally pointed out at some angle. In later depictions, it was shown with a fork at the end. Its ears also stand on end. They are elongated and have square tips. The nose or the snout of the creature is long and curled downwards. These features also appear on the head of the set as well as the straight tail. When depicted as an animal, it's normally at rest, either sitting or lying down. As a whole, the animal doesn't appear to resemble anything we know today. It also doesn't resemble any animal that we know existed in ancient times, but has since gone extinct. The currently accepted theory is that the animal was a complete figment of imagination. Throughout human history, humans have created stories of beasts that don't exist. Most of these resembled distorted versions of real animals, either a combination of animals or normal creatures much larger than anything ever seen by humans. Others are completely fictional with no basis in reality. It's possible that the set animal was one such creature. If this is the answer to the mystery, the next question has to be why this was done. No other animal that appears in the ancient Egyptian pantheon is fictional, or a combination of multiple different animals. They were all creatures that would have been known to the Egyptians, and seen on a relatively regular basis. It could be that Set's status as the god of disorder and foreigners could have led to him earning a more unique animal. It could have been a depiction of what the ancient Egyptians imagined lived out in the desert or beyond the borders of their land. The problem with this theory is just how consistent the depictions were. The Set animal appears in depictions of pre-dynastic Egypt, 
and existed through to the New Kingdom. The only significant change during this time was the fork in the set animal's tail. If it was a fictional animal, it would be extremely likely that the depictions would vary over time and from place to place, but this doesn't seem to happen. Just like the ancient Egyptians knew what they were drawing when they depicted crocodiles or hippopotamuses, they knew what they were drawing when they depicted the set animal. It's still possible that this creature could have been a combination of a few different animals. For example, the head of the animal seems similar to the Cape Aardvark. This creature lived on the outskirts of Egyptian villages and appeared only at night. It would have been a startling creature to come across, and the fact that it was able to devour thousands of ants at night would have given it a creepy image. But while there are similarities, there are also important differences. The ears of the aardvark are not square like the set animal, and its snout doesn't bend down, a prominent feature in depictions of set and the mysterious animal. Of course, the body of the animal more closely resembles a dog or jackal. There's already a jackal god, Anubis. Interestingly, Anubis has relatively dark associations, being a god of funerary rites and the guide of the underworld. But there is a significant difference in how ancient Egyptians depicted jackals and how the set animal was depicted. It seems likely this wasn't what the set animal was supposed to represent. Another possibility is that it was supposed to be a donkey of some kind. In the late period, after the New Kingdom, Set was typically depicted as a donkey rather than the mysterious Set animal. Why this change happened is unclear, but there were a lot of changes happening during the late period. It could be that the old association with the mysterious unknown animal was no longer deemed appropriate to the ancient Egyptians, and they decided that it should resemble a creature that they were more familiar with. Alternatively, it could simply be a new art style for an animal they'd always believed was a donkey. A less popular explanation is that the set animal is an extinct animal of some kind, but not one that modern humans have uncovered. If the animal was rare enough, or perhaps existed in the desert surrounding Egypt rather than in Egypt itself, the remains of any specimens could have remained undiscovered. In earlier periods, the creature could have been familiar enough to the Egyptians for it to have been depicted consistently, only for it to go extinct at some point during ancient Egypt's long history. If that were the case, it could be that this animal had gone extinct by the time the late period took place, and later Egyptians thought this animal was entirely fictional and decided to change it. For now, the truth about this animal remains a mystery, only adding to the mysterious and creepy persona that the god Set has taken on in more recent depictions. Number 1 on September 8, 1560, servants at the Cumnor Palace in England returned home to find the lady of the house lying motionless at the bottom of the house. Amy Dudley was no longer alive, and the cause for her passing would remain a mystery for hundreds of years. Officially, it was ruled an accident, but historians have disagreed, and new ideas about the possible cause have been put forward in recent years. Amy Dudley was the wife of Robert Dudley, 1st Earl of Leicester, and the favorite of Queen Elizabeth I. She was just 28 years old when she passed away. The Dudleys had married for about 10 years and had been through a lot of problems. At first, those problems were external. Robert's father had been the Duke of Northumberland, an advisor of King Edward VI, who tried to install Lady Jane Grey on the throne. That had cost the senior Dudley his life, and led to Robert Dudley being imprisoned in the Tower of London by Queen Mary. He would eventually be released from prison, but Robert and Amy were forced to rely on the support of their families to survive. Despite the problems, the young couple remained close and supported one another. None of their friends or family could imagine anything coming between them. When Elizabeth I took the throne, things should have improved for the Dudleys. They were devout and prominent Protestants and having a Protestant monarch would definitely have been an improvement for them both. Robert had also known Elizabeth when they were both children, which led to him being brought into the royal court. He was made the master of the horse and lord steward of the royal household, and afforded more privileges than anybody else. It was hardly a secret among her court that Dudley was Elizabeth's favorite. He had sleeping quarters adjacent to the queen's chambers. He was the only person permitted to touch the queen, and he was to be in her entourage at all times. In a matter of years, Dudley had gone from being in the Tower of London to being the second most powerful person in the country. 
Unfortunately for Amy, she didn't earn any grand positions. In fact, Elizabeth ordered that Amy should not be seen with Dudley when she was around. Dudley was still permitted to see his wife, but he would have to deny that anything happened with her on the occasions he went to visit her in one of the country's houses she lived in. There were rumors that Dudley was having an affair with the Queen. They apparently openly flirted, and even ambassadors from other countries were aware of how close the two were. Of course, any relationship couldn't be official, at least not while Amy Dudley was alive. On the morning of September 8, 1560, Amy sent her household staff away to the Abingdon Fair. She'd been very insistent that they go, even when some offered to stay at home. She wasn't alone, with her ladies in other parts of the house, but she seemed to want most of the staff gone. It was hours later that they returned home to find Amy Dudley no longer alive. She had a break in her neck and two wounds to the head. It appeared as if she'd fallen down the stairs, but the staircase was only made up of eight steps, and this explanation wouldn't account for the two wounds on the back of her head. An inquiry into her passing was set up, and Robert Dudley seemed like the most likely suspect. He had been away from home at the time, which was the norm for him, but he was powerful enough to have sent someone else to do the job for him. With Amy out of the way, he would be free to marry the Queen. He had even recently told the Spanish ambassador that he would be in a new position in a year's time. Dudley only made himself look even more suspicious by paying a large sum of money to the jury foreman, asking him to select jury members who would be discreet. He also paid a large sum of money to the owner of Cumnor Place and didn't attend Amy's funeral. But if Dudley had planned to take Amy's life so he could become Elizabeth's prince consort, the plan backfired. For many in court, he was the prime suspect. Even when the inquiry found that Amy had been the victim of a misadventure, people still suspected that he had something to do with her passing. He became a toxic person to be associated with, and even keeping him within her inner circle would have led to problems for Elizabeth. Dudley did remain close to Elizabeth, but any possibility that the two would be married disappeared. Elizabeth even suggested to her cousin Mary, Queen of Scots, that the Scottish Queen marry Dudley instead. Some have suggested that this was all part of the plan. The plan to take Amy's life hadn't been started by Dudley, but by one of his enemies. Dudley had little need to take his wife's life. He was already in a good position with the Queen, and Amy may have been ill when she passed away. She was believed to have been suffering from some ailment, which Dudley may have believed would have taken her life sooner rather than later. He could simply have waited until this happened and avoided any suspicion of being involved in her passing. This would have been a problem for those who wanted to use Amy to stop Dudley's rise to power. The prime suspect in this scenario was William Cecil, the Secretary of State, and the Queen's spymaster. Cecil was allegedly jealous of Dudley's power, and would have had the most to gain by removing him from the Queen's side. He had also told the Spanish ambassador that Amy Dudley was in good health, which doesn't appear to have been true. Cecil would have known that getting rid of Amy in such a suspicious way would have caused problems for Dudley, and he also would have had the power to have had someone else commit the crime. In the case of both Cecil and Dudley, and for anybody else, there's no evidence that they had anything to do with Amy's tragic end. Whatever happened, it's likely that Amy was suspecting something the day she passed away. She was very insistent that her servants leave the house, suggesting that she was expecting a visitor whom she didn't want to be discovered. If that were the case, there may have been some letters that may have indicated who Amy expected that visitor to be, though those have never been uncovered. A more recent suggestion put forward by Ian Aird in 1956 is that no foul play occurred. It's believed that Amy may have been suffering from cancer, which could have led to a spontaneous fracture in her neck and caused her to fall down the stairs. This wouldn't explain the two wounds to the back of her head or why she was so insistent that her servants leave the house, but there's as much evidence for this theory as there is for any other. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you liked this video, be sure to hit that like button. Also, don't forget to subscribe and click that notification bell to keep up to date with all of our future uploads. But my name is Ty Knotts and I'll catch you guys in the next video.